Yes, I have a short that's in Sundance, and out of 5,000 submissions, they took 70 of them, but really nobody cares. Like, nobody really cares. And no one's going to hand me an opportunity, and I have to make that opportunity for myself. Hi, welcome to Hollywood On Rep, the podcast where we interview successful people in Hollywood about how they got to where they are today. And that was Yi Chun, showrunner of Gremlin's Secrets of the Mogwai. <laughs> Never feed them after midnight. And executive producer of the new show from Boots Riley, I'm a Virgo. Be plenty more where that came from. We beat to rap what key beat to lock, but we beat you to rap. You are a 13 what foot lock, tall black man. Well, I'm a Virgo, and Virgos love adventure. Just wanted to start by saying I'm a Scorpio, and I bite <laughs> off more than I can chew. I'm a Pisces. And you are an executive producer of I'm a Virgo. Not sure what we're allowed to say about that show, but... It's a weird one. <laughs> I think people can see it imminently once uh, once this episode comes out. How did you get hooked up with Boots Riley? You know, it was a, it was a cold meeting. Um, basically, my manager had, had asked me, uh, were you a fan of Sorry to Bother You? And I was like, yeah, I really love that movie. I think Boots Riley is a really interesting filmmaker. Um, and I also have some friends in common with him. And um, my manager was like, you know, um, he has this new project. And it is about a 13-foot-tall, 19-year-old black kid growing up in Oakland. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, send me the script. And so I read the script. And, you know, with that synopsis, I didn't know really what to expect. But it was my favorite script, uh, my favorite pilot. I'd read in like maybe five to seven years. And so I knew I wanted to meet on it. And I met with Boots over Zoom. Um, I was in Massachusetts at the time and he was in Oakland and we, we just kind of hit it off. Anybody who's a fan of Sorry to Bother You is going to really love the show. What was it about the script that connected with you? Uh, well, I thought that it had a lot of what drives Boots and some of the same thematics as Sorry to Bother You. Um, but I was also, you know, I, I felt that as just a coming of age story, it was such a unique point of view and unique entryway into it. And I just also thought it was really funny. You know, Boots is a really funny writer. And um, that mix of like absurdity and social commentary and weirdness, but not weirdness for just the sake of weirdness. Um, and the show just has a lot of heart, uh, and that was something that we um, continued to be excited about through the writing process, and especially you know working with the cast. And the cast is incredible. You know, they, they to have a young cast like this and to be shooting over many months and to have them all become real friends. I think it was it was a really special experience. You served as both writer and executive producer on that. Can you kind of talk about what that means for people who might not? understand kind of how TV writing works? Sure. I worked for many years as a, well, I, I started off in indie film, um, but um, eventually I worked my way up in a TV writer's room and there's kind of different levels that you kind of every year or every two years you jump a level. And at some point you become um, a showrunner or a co-showrunner. And the showrunner is uh, an executive producer, but they're also uh a writer and they're responsible for running the writer's room, but also overseeing production. So for something like um, Virgo, uh, Boots had not worked in television before. Um, he was going to direct all the episodes. Uh, so I was brought in as his co-showrunner to, you know, uh, acquaint him with the process, um, help him creatively and to oversee or co-oversee uh, the production all the way through, um, through the shoot. And so you were the showrunner on Gremlins, Secrets of the Mogwai, mm -hmm. on Max. What stage was that show in when you started talking to Boots about getting involved with Virgo? I had been staffing on TV shows for a certain amount of time, for about five years. And then I jumped over to showrunning Gremlins. Um, that was uh, Warner Brothers Animation and Amblin knew that they wanted to do a Gremlins animated prequel set in China with um, the the older Mr. Wing from the original movies, but back when he was a kid. And I came in and I pitched on it, and my take on it was uh, wanting to do it like a big serialized version of like the Amblin movies that I grew up watching, things like Goonies and Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's a kind of like a treasure hunting component to it. 
And we did a year in the writer's room, kicked off the production. All the animators were working on it. And then the pandemic hit. And we had luckily talked about the second season. We were about to pitch the second season. And we pitched the second season within the first like month of the pandemic when everyone just kind of unplugged their computers and went home. But because it was animated, we were able to keep working, which obviously we were very thankful for. Um, everyone just... And, and it's a testament to our line producer, Danielle, who she had just seen the pandemic coming down the line and March 12th or whatever it was said, it's happening. <laughs> like there's yeah. five Google Docs in your shared drive that we can look at. And that is the workflow that we're going to be using moving forward for the next, hopefully, couple of weeks. You know, it'll be <laughs> years. And um, so I was two years into it. I had finished writing the second season with the writers and done a lot of the front end lifting for the second season. We we're very lucky that we got a second season before the first season premiered. And then, you know, I had kind of gone to the point where I could consult on Gremlins. It was kind of on rails. And obviously there was a lot of stuff still to be done, still like two, three years worth of stuff to be done. But um, I started looking for something else and, and I wanted to do something and, um I wanted to prove myself in live action because I had come up through live action, but I'd only show ran an animated show. And um, I don't really have a preference for either one. I just knew that I wanted to also have um, that credit to, to have show run a live action show. I'm guessing you didn't imagine that these shows would both be premiering within like a month and a half of each other as you were making them. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good lesson about animation that uh, I pitched this show five years ago. It was the first thing that, Untitled Warner Media streaming service bought, I think. Um, and now, five years later, uh, it's finally coming out. Uh, second season is almost done. Um, but yeah, it's wild that um, Gremlins premiered May 23rd and um, it's going to have its season finale on June 22nd. And then the next day, we premiere um, I'm a Virgo on, on June 23rd. So, Gremlins, that, was that like an open writing assignment that? your um, agents and managers brought to you? I guess I should just tell the story because it's very, it goes to some of the serendipity of this industry. Um, yeah. I'm like, for many years, I was just very much like, all right, I'm keeping my head down and writing and working. And it was hard to like get me to like go out and go have dinner. And um, my wife was like, you should, we should go have dinner with a friend. And I had dinner with a high school friend, Will Graham, who's a very successful TV showrunner. He just did um, League of Their Own and Daisy Jones and the Six. And um, his boyfriend at the time, um, now husband, Clint, um, was at dinner with us, and we just had a nice time. And then um, at the same time, Clint was uh, – he's an exec at Amblin, and I was working at Warner Brothers on Gotham, and I'd been double promoted my last year. I'd really proved myself in that room – and so it was this weird thing where Warner Brothers had a list of people and Amblin was in the room, and Clint was in the room when they were going through the list of people. And he was like, oh, I just met that guy. And then I got a Facebook message from Clint that was like, hey, man, um, do you like Gremlins? And I was like, uh, yeah, why? And, um, you know, I, I found that the process was uh, – having been through many different stages of my career in terms of like going out for open writing assignments and feeling like sometimes you feel like it's a cattle call where it's like, I mean, I was on, I, I met on some big property a few years ago and they were like, Hey, you know, you're like the f 40th or 50th writer that we've met with on this. And I was like, so I just wasted two weeks of my life <laughs> coming up with this pitch. Um, but Amblin and Warners were very respectful. I think, I think they only met with a few people and they were very clear that they wanted to just have a conversation first and not come in and do all this front end work and then come into pitch. And I went in that first day and I was just kind of talked about what I wanted to do with the show. And that kind of lack of pressure was really nice. It was just like a conversation. I talked a lot about what I loved about the original Gremlins movies, how I want to do something that was in the vein of this like Amblin-esque adventure. Um, the movies that appealed to me when I was a kid was a lot of them were about kids that were stuck in life or death situations, but still had that sense of like wonderment and drama and excitement and scares. And I also talked a lot about um, 
the Chinese mythology creatures and monsters that I grew up uh, hearing about or watching in Chinese movies and TV shows and feeling like this could be an opportunity to have all of that stuff dovetail into, you know, one big epic story. Um, and they were like, okay, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's back up a little bit further because you, you mentioned independent film. What made you want to get into this industry? When did you first have the thought that this is something I want to do in writing specifically? I'd always been a big movie fan. Um, my mom, um, I was raised by a single mom and um, it was me and my sister. And um, one of the things that she used to do, because I, I think she had this real love of movies. Um, she, she grew up as an orphan in Singapore and Hong Kong. And one of the stories that she told, which I only really processed many years later, was um, because she kind of switched hands a lot of times, had a lot of kind of paternal uh, uh, parental figures, but, you know, it was not uh, necessarily like a loving environment. Uh, she remembers that the only time she ever felt uh, she was ever embraced by an adult was when you go to, went to the movie theater, as long as you had the child in your lap, you didn't have to pay for an extra ticket. And so she has these memories of, she, she, she told me that, you know, that's the only time she ever felt like the embrace of an adult. And I thought that was really beautiful. And it certainly goes to, it, it made me kind of remember all the times and how excited she would be to bring us to movies on her day off. And even during spring break, and I, I'm, I'm almost certain that this is when I saw Gremlins and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Goonies was uh, for spring break, you know, because she was always working, um, we would, uh, our spring break was basically we would go to Blockbuster Video or the Chinese video store and we would rent, you know, maybe three, four or five movies a day and just watch them all day. And that was kind of my film education, even though at the time I wasn't thinking that I wanted to be a filmmaker or a TV writer mm -hmm. or anything. I just was exposed to a lot of movies at that time. I mean, there was times where, yeah, we'd watch something like Gremlins, and then later on that day we would watch like Fanny and Alexander or like some art movie. And it was really a great education. Um, all through middle school, I thought I wanted to be a comic book artist, um, and I really wanted to pursue that. And then around beginning of high school, I started hanging around the AV department in my high school. And, you know, the AV department, the audiovisual department, it's usually kind of like nerdy kids, like, like, you know, and, you know, I was definitely like into like Magic the Gathering and all the nerdy stuff. And the cool thing about my school was that they had video cameras that you could check out for free. And they also had an editing deck. And back in the day, those were like, tape to tape, like two, essentially like two VCRs. And you would, I, I just went off and I was like, you know what? Like, I want to tell all these stories. I've always liked writing, whether it was a comic book or, or whatever. Um, but if I can just grab a camera, I don't have to draw everything. I could just film it. And so um, I looped together all my friends and I made, um, over the course of high school, I made like two features and a bunch of short films. And looking back, like that was the best education I could have had um, to just know, like I had to be proactive. I had to, I had to be shooting and editing and and learning all the different facets of of what production was. And that's kind of how I started getting into it. So you were an artist, a visual artist, and you did uh, some art that ended up in the film Half Nelson. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so through college, I also made my own, like, in, like uh, I made, I think, two features and a sh bunch of short films. And I also continued to, even though I wasn't drawing comic books, I moved into doing more like portraiture and fine art. And after college, I didn't really want to go to grad school because I just, I don't know, I, I think I was sick of school. And so... I did a lot of painting portraits for people, um, whether that was portraits of them or their kids. I, I painted portraits of dogs. Like I just was painting all the time. And um, when I did my short film, Window Breaker, um, oh, so basically while I was doing, I was painting, I made a schedule for myself. I knew I wanted to do film. And uh, I made a schedule for myself to write and direct a no-budget short film every six months and write a feature film every nine months. And I did that wow. for three and a half years. 
And part of it was just a numbers game, like knowing that like, okay, I need to get better at it. I know that I am only going to get better at it if I'm doing it. And I'm not going to finance some like, you know, there were kids who were spending like $50,000 on their short film. And I was like, I'm going to spend like between like a hundred dollars and like a thousand dollars on these short films. And my short film that got into Sundance, the budget of that was $600. I shot it in my childhood home. The lighting wow. kit was 57 or $70 a weekend. I shot over two weekends. Um, everybody worked for free. You know, my producer who also held the boom mic, um, also acted in the movie. My mom is in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that all of it was just trying to get a good grounding and feel less nervous when I was on set. So then how did your portraits get to the half Delson people? Oh, right. Right. That was the question. Um, <laughs> that's okay. So in 2006, I directed window breaker and I spent like a couple months like editing it. And I just like, I, I couldn't, I was too close to it. And I was shot it almost documentary style. So there was so much footage. And at the time, um, Anna Bowden, who uh, was Ryan Fleck's uh, directing partner, they, they directed like Captain Marvel and a bunch of incredible indie films. They had just directed Half Nelson and they said, um, can you paint a portrait? Can you paint a poster for it? And I said, I will paint a poster for it if Anna, if you can just please bail my ass out and edit this movie. And she did. And, you know, she was editing my short while I was painting the poster for it. And at the time, I also did some, or maybe it was a year year or two later, I did a lot of drawings for Filmmaker Magazine as well. Um, oh, cool. But yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it was like seeing the poster in different places. And yeah, it was a, it was a real fun experience. Let's not gloss over real quick, though, how you ended up knowing her in the first place. So I knew Anna from college. Uh, she was a okay. year above me. And then I think she took a year off and then ended up in my class. Um, but we would always talk about like what we want to do in the film industry. And I mean, she was, Ryan was, I think a little further along in his career. I think he had been out of school a couple of years, um, but he had had shorts. I, had, I think one slam dance. He, you know, I think very soon after graduating, maybe it was like 2004, 2005, their short film, Gowanus Brooklyn, which was a short version of Half Nelson, I think won some prize at Sundance. And so they were really the only folks I knew um, who were, you know, getting their foot in the door um, in the film in the film industry. So then moving on to um, Children of Invention, was that one of the the three year every nine month write a feature projects? It wasn't, uh, and I, I, it's actually a good, it was a good lesson. So um, in 2007, Window Breaker went to Sundance, even though it cost $600 to make, I had to spend $2,500 to like up res it to HD, like things that were just, it was just so funny. And I remember being at Sundance and so many of these projects were, the shorts were like, had been really slickly produced as opposed to like, you know, shotting, I shot it on a one chip mini DV camera. Yeah. Um, but I had a couple scripts I wanted to make, but they were relatively ambitious. And I think coming out of Sundance with a short, I think um, Eric Mendelson, who was a teacher at Columbia, um, when I got my, my short into uh, Sundance, um, they started inviting me to some of the Columbia grad events. And one of the things he said, which I thought was so interesting, was like, yeah, we thought I, you know, he was like, whenever I bring a film early on, when I brought a film to a film festival, I thought, oh, this is where it's going to be celebrated. And once you get there, you realize that this is where a film goes to die. <laughs> and <laughs> it was such a wake up call. And then with that context, when I went to Sundance, I just remember being like, oh, um, yes, I have a short that's in Sundance. And out of 5,000 submissions, they took 70 of them, but really nobody cares. Like nobody really cares. And no one's going to hand me an opportunity and I have to make that opportunity for myself. And that was a, one of a series of awakenings in indie film. But that one was one where, um, you know, I came out of that experience and said, okay, well, no one really cares. And I have these two ambitious features that I thought were going to be my first couple features, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think that I can convince somebody to make a feature that's this ambitious. I think I have to write something that I know that I can prove I can make at a very small budget. And I wrote Children of Invention after that. Um, and 
I was actually started brainstorming it when I first got my first TV job with a writing partner in LA. Um, I'd gotten a manager out of Sundance and we had a pilot um, that got us staffed on a TV show called Cashmere Mafia, um, which was a casualty of the 2007 writer's strike. And when we went on strike, I just wrote um, this personal project, Children of Invention, and finished it. And we were in production the next summer and then submitted it to Sundance. And so between the short and feature, it was only two years, which um, nowadays I think feels relatively quick. Um, at the time, I thought that was the bar because my only two friends I'd seen do it, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck, it was two years between their short and their feature. So I was like, all right, I want to try to do that. Wow. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a good lesson of just like, you never know what your first feature is going to be. You have to be able to pivot and to do something in order to push it through. Because the friends that I have had that have gotten really locked into what they think their first feature is, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's it's just not, it's not in the cards. Maybe it's their second or third feature, but it's certainly not their first. So from there you went on, were you also pursuing more TV work as the strike ended? After I had my first feature at Sundance... Um, it was kind of just a bigger version of the experience that I had in 07, where I think it was a different time. It was also during a, um, uh, economic crisis. And, you know, I felt that, um, I did everything I wanted to do with the movie to some degree creatively, but I also knew that it was a small indie family drama with Asian American characters and that, the industry, when I went to general meetings after that, just didn't really care. Um, and there wasn't like, you did that, now you get to do this. It was more like, okay, thanks for doing that. And I started meeting a lot of indie filmmakers. And, you know, the indie film, I mean, I think, I think working in this industry is like a series of awakenings. And if you're able to take that information and spin something good out of it, I think that that's really where... I, certainly for me, that's where like my resilience lies is just being able to be really honest with myself about like maybe something's not working. And I started meeting all these indie filmmakers. And what I realized was that nobody, unless they were independently wealthy, could make a career and a living out of indie film. And so what happened was I thought, well, this career path that I thought existed doesn't actually exist. Surprise. <laughs> And at the time, I also could see that something, this is 2010, 2011, 2012, I could see that something really interesting was happening in television. Um, even between 2007 and 2011, 2012, when I moved back to LA, there was all these different places that were creating really interesting work. And also, I felt a little like some of the movies and the types of stories that I was trying to tell an indie film were actually easier to tell in television. And that while indie film felt like it was um, the bottom was starting to fall out of it, TV was expanding in such a way where people were able to take more risks. And I think it's one of the counterintuitive things where you think independent film, you can take a lot of risks, but in a financial model where so many movies fail, uh, I found it was actually the opposite. Whereas in television, because it was kind of hard, I mean, during those years to lose money because of the way that like um, international sales were done, that they were actually able to take more risks. And did I ever think that like a show like I'm a Virgo would be on a, a platform like Amazon or, you know, like a, a giant platform? Would I ever have thought that, you know, I, we could do Gremlins as an Asian story set in 1920s China on something like Max. I mean, I think it is. I think it is easy to get um, cynical about the industry, but at the same time, I just look at the things that we've been able to do in the last few years, and I feel really thankful that um, we're able to do projects like this and to have them be beamed into people's homes, and they're able to take a chance on um, some some kind of like interesting, weird stories that we're telling. That's great. Before we go, I do want to touch really quickly on um, Little America because you mentioned your mom and um, how did that come to you? Yeah, so Little America is maybe besides Gremlins, the most other most like serendipitous weird way that that came about. I had been 
meeting with um, Epic Magazine, um, which uh, you know they they ended up uh, producing the book that Little America is based on, um, with a lot of immigrant stories that are actually not even in the show. Um, they did a, a wide range. It's a great book. It's uh, Little American. You should pick it up if you haven't. I was going in to meet with them, and they were like, "Well." Um, how did you start this comic book company? And I said, well, I, I can tell you the story. It's like uh, uh, I met my co-founder on a cruise. Um, and basically when I was a teenager, um, we didn't have enough money to go on vacation. So uh, every year we would go to the vacation expo in Boston. My mom would take us to a place where they show you all the vacations you could go on if you have money. And she also gets everywhere really early. So we showed up one uh, one one winter at the vacation expo really early and there was a freak snowstorm and um, the only people there were the vendors and we were in the parking lot for like an hour before the doors opened. So finally the doors opened we walked in and only the vendors are there. And my mom had this incredible idea. She just turned to us and she was like, let's enter every single raffle and we want a cruise and we want like a ski vacation and we want a timeshare. And the last two ended up being like complete scams, but the cruise was real and we had, uh, a two person like romantic cruise that we could go on. Uh, we ended up, our car got T boned by another car like a month before and we used the insurance money to buy the third ticket for my little sister. And then we went on this cruise and, um, I told the story and the folks at Epic Magazine were like, huh, that sounds like an episode of Little America. And I was like, what's Little America? And they're like, it's a show we're working about immigrants and, such an interesting story. Do you mind if we pitch it to Apple? And I was like, yeah, you pitch it to anyone. I don't, I don't know. It sounds like science fiction, like whatever you want to do. And I didn't hear anything for a little while. And then like, a, like I think I feel like six weeks or a couple months later, um, my agent called and was like, hey, did you pitch an episode of Little America? And I had kind of forgotten about it. And then they were like, they want to make you an offer. They want to, they want to make the episode. And then a couple months later, three months later, I was shooting on a cruise ship, um, with a lady playing my mom and two kids playing me and my, my little sister. And it was really an incredible experience. I mean, I'm so thankful that I got to tell that story in that way. And um, all the producers on the show were just really fantastic. And I, I really felt supported in terms of um, dramatizing uh, my, my mom's real life. And then speaking of serendipity, there was like an intro that they shot to your episode. That's right. That's right. I ended up coming on to be the assistant editor on that oh reshoot. And, uh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's how I first uh, became aware of you and um, your stuff. That's and, so uh, great. I love that intro. Yeah. I, it was one of those things where actually like when the, I think when the kids get dropped off, I think that was the first scene of the original script. And then when we were done shooting, we just, I mean, I'd come back from shooting um, <laughs> um, like, four days on a cruise ship and like it was it was this really crazy thing and then the edit came in they were like you know why don't we add a like up style montage at the beginning so that you can see why she's so invested in her kids and i was like sure i mean if you have the money to do it i would love to do that and we spent two days shooting at um at universal and um it just i mean the show the show was such a surreal experience because you know, after shooting the initial episode, just even then going and shooting that new intro, that kind of is everything from, you know, birth through um, us in our teens. Um, we just recreated like so many different things from my childhood and from my sister's childhood. Um, but it was a really wonderful experience. That's so great that you worked on it. I was really, it's, I'm one of, it's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of. Here we are, there's another writer strike going on. I know it's not quite um, the same situation. We don't want people to go out and make Children of Invention 2 or anything like that right now. But um, what would you say to somebody who's trying to get into the industry right now? It feels unprecedented. You know, um, I know that some of the things we're striking for, there's no, um, there's no precedence for it in the past. Some of them there is. Um, I think that there's a lot of solidarity between the unions right now, as far as I can tell. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we've really appreciated on the picket line is uh, pre-WGA folks, people who are trying to break into the industry, coming out to support um, 
I don't know what it is, but it feels less insular than the 07 strike. I feel like in the 07 strike, sometimes people would come and it felt a little bit more clicky. But I also think, you know, social media maybe has also kind of democratized some of these things. And I'm always happy to talk, you know, to folks who are trying to break into the industry um, on the picket line. It's just it's a good place to show solidarity. And, you know, if you break into the industry, the, this this fight becomes their fight. Um we're in a shutdown in terms of working for struck companies, but that doesn't mean that you can't work on your personal work. And um, it's a good time to do that if you're just trying to get your foot in the door. You know, it's a, it's a real slowdown. What happened at the end of the last strike was that there was a real hunger for material and things going into production after the strike happened. So even though it feels really dire. I know the writers that I, I I'm picketing with, it feels really hard. I mean, this could go on for a few months. Um, to some degree, maybe we can make it for lost time and for people who are trying to break into the industry, even though things are totally shut down now. Um, there may be a lot of opportunities coming out of this strike, but I know it really seems like the first four or f- five weeks of the strike, there's like, we're trying to keep our spirits up. I think we're in this for the long haul. And, um, you know, I'm a relatively op- like like optimistic person. And um, I just think for folks that are trying to break in, just know that this is not going to be forever and you're not going to be stalled out forever. And, you know, we appreciate everything that, you know, people have been doing in solidarity with the writers. If I was getting started today, I'd follow Aziz's lead and set a schedule for myself to write or shoot or edit a film every six months or whatever worked for my schedule and goals. The main thing is consistency because that will put you in the position to take advantage of the serendipity that Z talks about. If you'd rather listen to these interviews as a podcast, follow Hollywood On Ramp on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Gremlin Secrets of the Mogwai on Max and don't forget to check out I'm a Virgo on Prime Video. How about this, mother? I'll sell another guy! I ain't got no giant! Yeah.